Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for those who are joining us in person and those who are online. Um, today we have Leela Foreman with us. Uh, her, the title of her talk is Graphic Materiality, Trauma, and Expressionist Comics Artist Talk with Leela Foreman. <laughs> um, Foreman is a painter, educator, and graphic novel creator. Her books include Ulter Zappen and the short comics collection We All Wish for Deadly Force. She's currently at work on the graphic novel Victory Parade, a story about World War II, women's wrestling, and the liberation of Buchenwald concentration camp. And her short comics have appeared in The Believer magazine, Tablet magazine, Nautilus, and The Nip. And before I turn it over to her, I will just mention that next week is uh, Veterans Day. So we, uh, it's an MIT holiday, and we will not have a colloquium. And then following that on November 18, we have Craig Robertson with Information at Your Fingertips, the filing cabinets and the gendering of information work. Filing cabinet history. So it just seems nerd -tastic, right? So it's going to be fantastic um, and nerd -tastic. Uh, So I hope to see many of you there. That will be a uh, hybrid um, in person and also, of course, on Zoom. So without further ado, I bring you to the local comment. Hi. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to be here in person with everyone. Uh, I want to go to this filing cabinet talk. I, I think I'm going to have to join virtually. Um, okay, so uh, as Heather mentioned, I'm a cartoonist, uh, painter. I was an illustrator for a long time. I, I, I had a kind of a funny trajectory as an artist where I, I started out, I grew up thinking I was going to be a painter. I had a sort of checkered path through art school where I kept quitting in disgust and then coming back and quitting in disgust again and coming back. And finally, I decided, okay, I want to get paid to draw pictures. So I'm going to major in illustration. And I just put my head down and did that. And that was my job for a good 15 years solidly, I want to say, something like that. I was also making comics at the same time. So I started making comics while I was in art school, um, living not too far away from here, actually, in an attic in Central Square, where I spent an entire winter listening to Diamanda Galas and trying to make comics <laughs> without really knowing how they were done <laughs> um, until my housemate begged me to stop listening to Diamanda Galas all the time, every day. And uh, no one begged me to stop making comics, which was good <laughs> because I kept going. Um, so when I discovered that there were people making mini comics, I, that's when it really clicked for me. And I thought, okay, this, this is how you do it. Uh, I recognize this art form because I've been reading zines for years. This is just comics in zine form. So I started making mini comics and self-publishing them. And that was the beginning of my incredibly illustrious career in <laughs> America's favorite gutter art form. Um, no pun intended. So I'm here to talk a little bit about more recent work though. So I wanna, I guess I will start by talking about my first big graphic novel, which was called Unterzaken, which is a Yiddish word, kind of, kind of. Um, I worked with a Yiddish translator on this book, just kind of informally. I just worked with her, meaning I would email her occasionally and say, hey, uh, Riva, what's a good word for kind of underwear, but not really underwear, more like under things. And this was the word that she gave me. I believe that it is no dialect of Yiddish. It is a kind of an academic word that comes from the academic teaching of Yiddish uh, as a, <sighs> it's not a dead language at all, um, but it's not, this, this word might not be a living word. I'm not sure. My mother grew up speaking Yiddish and she didn't recognize it. So this book was set uh, on the Lower East Side of New York City at the turn of the last century and largely concerns the lives and activities of a pair of twins named Fania and Esther who are growing up in a tenement. Um, oh, right, my screen isn't shared. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you've got a bunch of windows open, which one? Uh, well, let's go to the slideshow. Um, we can go here, yeah. Thank you. And you know what? Let's go back to the book cover so that the, there we go, it's great. Thanks. So I should stress, this is a work of fiction. Um, it's, a, it's literally a graphic novel. Uh, 
meaning it's a work of literary fiction in comics form, not, not autobiographical, which is funny because people have sometimes asked me if it is, and I just look at them and I say, do you see a pair of twins here? And is it 1909? <laughs> <laughs> um, the original idea for this book came at a time when the discourse around reproductive rights, reproductive freedom was getting heated and ugly again, although I don't think it's ever not been heated and ugly in this country. Uh, it was in the George W. Bush years though, and it was starting to get ominous again. So I was thinking about this and I was walking to the uh, 63rd Street YMCA in Manhattan where I had gone to camp as a little kid, I was going to see the cartoonist Kim Deitch give a talk. And I was sitting there and I suddenly had this image in my head of the character of Fania um, that I drew on a napkin, which I really wish I still had. <laughs> and it's, of course that is lost to time. Um, and suddenly all the characters tumbled out of my head. This set of twins, their mother, their, their traumatized father from Russia, the entire neighborhood that they lived in and the trajectory of both of these girls' lives. Uh, and I spent many years creating this book. So um, I was working in ink here and computer gray tones. So those are not cut half tones, although uh, I, I have spent a lot of time with an X-Acto knife and sheets of half tone. I don't do that anymore. Um, I would call this kind of my old comic style that I, I honed when I was making mini comics. Greek mythology came out a lot when I was working on this book. Uh, so there's a lot of references to the myth of Persephone and to the Odyssey in this book. I'm, I'm purposely not showing a ton of this. so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this but I'm happy to talk about this book if people want to once we get to the end. Um, I am, so let me not get ahead of myself. I published this book in 2012 and then a whole bunch of things happened in my life. And emerging from that, I started making short autobiographical comics, which I had said I would never do. And yet, and yet, I ended up doing them. So pardon me while I fumble around on the screen just a little bit. I have only brought the most recent one to show you. I, I've done quite a few short autobiographical comics since this, uh, since then. But this is a piece that I did last spring. Sorry, I think you have to share. Do I have to share a new? Okay. Um, Let's not share. Actually, did can I? Yeah. So, in in two, November two thousand eleven, I delivered I was talking to my publisher, November second, and on November seventeenth two thousand eleven, my daughter died suddenly. So, I spent about a year just not being able to do anything. Uh, and then when I emerged from that, I only wanted to make comics. Illustration seemed very useless. Um, I didn't stop being an illustrator. Am I sharing now? Because this yes, is still yes, popping up. Sharing. Okay, there we go. Yeah. You'll have to forgive some of my technical fumbling. Uh, I'm used to sharing from my own screen at home while I'm teaching, but not this many things at once. Uh, so... I started making short autobiographical comics as I was kind of emerging from the, the year of trauma after that. And I, I, I started to get very excited about working with um, reportage and research and, and my own personal experience again. That's a place a lot of us start in comics because it's a good place to start, but going from there into fiction was really fun. Going back was also really great. So this is a piece that I did Last year, uh, two years ago, I, I went to Poland for the first time to visit my grandfather's hometown. It's a kind of a shaggy dog story. It's in this piece, but how do I make this as short as possible? I found out that there's a group of people in my grandfather's hometown, specifically one guy uh, mainly, who is obsessed with researching the Jewish history of the town and reconnecting with all of the living descendants of the Jews of this little tiny town. It's like a two street town in southeastern Poland called Grybów. Um, and there's a whole lot of other crazy stuff attached to all of that. But the upshot of this is that I went to Poland for the dedication of a memorial in the Jewish cemetery of my grandfather's town. And I thought I was going to have this really heavy, really dark time. And instead, 
what happened was I ended up falling in love with Poland, uh, with everything about it. And now all I can think about is going back to Poland and making comics about Poland. Um, that, you know, I went back and they stuck a mountain of pierogies in front of me. <laughs> they took me to a mass grave where my great grandparents are. And then they filled me with pierogies. <laughs> um, part of what happened was that I, I found out about all of these connections through a student of mine at UF who said, oh, I've never been to Poland. I went to this little tiny town called Grybów because there's this guy in my shul in West Palm Beach who, who grew up there. And it turns out this guy grew up next door to my grandfather and was in Auschwitz with Primo Levi. And here he is telling me this whole story where he's telling me how nobody thought Primo Levi was Jewish because he didn't speak Yiddish. Uh, Primo Levi is one of my favorite writers. So as he's telling me this, I'm just kind of sitting there staring at him like, I can't believe I'm hearing this. This is amazing. Um, and something I really enjoy doing in my fiction and my nonfiction is playing with that line between the living and the dead, the worlds of the living and the dead. I'm going to start to get more into that as we move further into this presentation, but this is where it starts to happen in this story. Um, The glass lanterns are part of the tradition for All Saints Day of bringing glass lanterns to the cemetery and, and uh, paying respect to your dead ancestors. This is a, a Catholic tradition as far as I know in Poland, but they did it in the Jewish cemetery anyway. So here I'm imagining that the, that the spirits of all of my dead um, great aunts and great grandparents are complaining about my short skirt and lack of Yiddish language abilities <laughs> in the cemetery. Um, so, I want to talk before I get into my newest project about artistic influences and a few other things, but I'm going to stop here for a second and talk about um, working with comics as a material art form a little bit too. So when I started to talk about playing with the boundary between life and death and the worlds of the living and the dead, that is where the materiality of making comics comes in for me. I've been thinking about this a lot in the context of a lot of art forms, drawing and painting art forms. Where does the mark become the work? Before I came here, I went to the Harvard Art Museum and I was, I was thinking about this a lot as I was in, in the room full of um, abstract expressionist paintings and related kind of mid-century work. And I, I, it's, I don't have an answer to that question. I just want that question floating in, in space in front of me all the time. I think that there is uh, an extreme physical pleasure in making marks that become work, right? That sometimes that pleasure in, in making the mark itself is the work. And finding that when you're making something is, is exhilarating. So I find it when I am working with viscosity and color in my comics, and I don't know if this comes across in print or in a scan, uh, there's a materiality and physicality to my work that exists in the originals that is hard to translate. However, sometimes, interestingly, it, uh, it can come through, and I'll, I'll explain that when we get to that page. Um, so these questions of materiality and physicality, are they're, they're open ones. They're, they're not answered questions. They never should be. I guess also I'm thinking about this a lot because I teach comics and, I, and I'm observing how many people are working with digital materials now. And I think it's great. I, uh, I love digital comics. I think all those tools are beautiful. Um, I personally happen to like to work by hand. And for me, there's a, there's a tactility and a physical experience that is very important. <laughs> It's not just one experience. It's the experience of my body as I'm drawing. It's also, it's also what the materials do and the way they lead you into the story itself, that they, they are the work sometimes. All right, so I'll do another screen share. Where are you? Oh dear. Weirdly, I can't 
find the one I'm looking for, which is this one back here. What's that? Okay. Now, do you see it? Oh, you know what? I thought. Oh, I think it's this one. I think it thinks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah. That's a mistake. That particular slide shouldn't be in there. So now I want to talk about influences. And I think that this is a really important thing to think about. Um, I always get that line from a, an early fall single in my head. I'm eternally grateful to my past influences. Um, that's from the song, How I Wrote Elastic Man, if you're a fan of the fall. And now it's going to be in my head all night. Um, so when I'm teaching, what I tell my students is the, the the way to become a good illustrator, a good cartoonist is to make sure you're filling yourself with good material, uh, which is like very obvious, but there's saying anyway. So what are, what are you putting in your, I, I like to use the word nebula. I think of it as kind of a, a nebula around you that you're reaching into and pulling from when you're working. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is the filmmaker Pedro Almodovar, who taught me more than anybody else has about nonverbal communication in a story with color. So yesterday when I was putting this presentation together, I actually just typed um, color in Almodovar films into Google. And I actually, I came up, I, a lot of interesting stuff came up. Uh, many pieces of writing, a surprising number of uh, palettes that people have created from his different films, um, which of course you can purchase as a poster or a tote bag or a yoga mat. Uh, so maybe I'll do that at some point. Um, this is a still from the film All About My Mother, which is an amazing, amazing movie. I just rewatched that. And you know, I think I love almost all of his films unreservedly, but I think this one might be my favorite. Uh, I also wanna talk about the influence of Weimar era art on my work, uh, specifically the new objectivity painters. So this is a print by Otto Dix. I'm gonna talk about Otto Dix a little bit and I'm not gonna talk about this from an art history perspective because I'm not qualified to do that. <laughs> um, I, I really wish I could, but uh, I'm, I'm just a puny ant staring at the pictures most of the time and taking them in and letting them influence me in ways that I'm not even fully aware of when I'm working. But in the book I'm about to talk about, Otto Dix's influence looms very, very large. So these are drawings and prints that he created in the immediate aftermath of the First World War after serving in, in the war, but also from observations in, in Berlin. This is really small. Is the screen being properly shared because there's no green edge around it? Yeah, it's showing the, um, the whole screen. Is it showing? Oh. You know what? I'm not even going to bother with that one because it's too small. But I can help you. Uh, that would be great. Yeah, let's do that. Because I don't want to go back to that really grotesque image. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I am incredibly fascinated with these artists. And Otto Dix, of course, is only one. He just happens to be one who looms really large over my work. and. I'll go down to a painting that I steal from a lot. This is his uh, war triptych, Triptychon de Krieg. You'll have to excuse me. I have absolutely zero ability to replicate a German accent. So anything I say, any German words I try to say, I'm just going to sound like an American saying them. <laughs> uh, this is an incredible painting that I've never seen in real life, but I am absolutely obsessed with it. Obviously, it is a painting about trench warfare in the style of a medieval altarpiece. Uh, these legs in the upper right corner of the center panel, I, I have a habit of stealing them and putting them into a lot of my comics. There's almost always a place for them. I think this painting is absolutely stunning and I, I hope to see it in person one of these days. Um, we're not gonna talk about Love and Rockets yet that we're going to talk about. We are going to talk about, well, you know, oh, you know what? There's one 
that I thought I put in here, but it doesn't seem to be in here because I'm, I put it in this morning. That's okay. Actually, let's talk about Love and Rockets before we talk about Seven Beauties. So another huge influence is this comic, Love and Rockets. And I really hope that, um, that you read it one of these days. It is, and to my mind, the best comic ever created in the English language. And I'm being really specific about that because comics is a global art form. And there's, I'm never going to say what the best comic is. I, 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 you know, I don't believe there's ever a best anything, really. Except for Love and Rockets, that's the best comic. Uh, especially anything by Jaime. So this is a comic created by Jaime and Gilbert Hernandez and originally their brother Mario, um, who I think dropped out after the first issue, I'm not sure. They've been doing it since the early 80s and it's deep and extremely intertwined storytelling that you kind of have to start at the beginning with. Um, this, is a, this is a Jaime Hernandez cover. And let's just go up here. And this is the cover of, the, of Gilbert's book, Poison River, which has been a massive influence on the kind of stories that I always wanted to tell. So I think these were the first comics I read that, that told me you could say anything in this art form and you could be very serious and talk about uh, dire things, talk about very personal things, talk about interiority, show interiority, and also trauma in comics. If you read only one book by Gilbert Hernandez in your life, make it this one. It's a bit of an origin story of a character who shows up all the way through. The other and other cartoonist who really taught me that you could do almost anything in comics is Phoebe Gleckner. Uh, and you know what? How did you zoom in? Did you just command plus? Okay. So Phoebe is a cartoonist originally from San Francisco. Um, these are a couple of pages from her story, Nightmare on Polk Street in her collection of Child's Life. I read this, I think, I don't know, I was like 19 or 20 and it just blew my mind. I've never been able to stop thinking about it. If you've seen the film Diary, is it Diary of a Teenage Girl? Oh my God, why am I half blanking on that title? Yeah, that's the title. Um, that's based on Phoebe's book that's kind of a combination of prose and comics and pulls from this story a lot, although it takes the teeth out of it and, and the really severe longer term part of the story kind of, I felt wasn't really in there, although it's an amazing movie and I recommend it. Um, what actually is going on in this story is so much more intense. Um, and that's, that's from the very end of the story. Phoebe started out as a medical illustrator. That's her training. So that's um, one reason why her work is so meticulously grotesque. I've only included a few cartoonists here. I could talk all night about <laughs> art in, in comics and in other art forms that has been a massive influence on me. I will say, I think I put myself squarely in the tradition of expressionism and new objectivity, painting and drawing. And I'm not sure if Phoebe or the Hernandez brothers would say that, but I would say they're very expressionistic and not concerned with making work that is cute or, um, neutral in any way, visually or, or, or textually. So I'm gonna get a little closer now to the work that I'm doing now. This is a still from Lena Wertmuller's film, Seven Beauties, which I highly recommend. Um, I mean, you know, I'll also give a content warning. It's, it, it's full of stuff that will upset you. <laughs> in so many ways. It will trigger warning for everything, basically, content warning for everything. Um, so I started, I, uh -huh. I come from a family of Holocaust survivors and I tried to get away from doing work about that time period for a very long time. And it just kept pulling me back and pulling me back. It's like a vortex. I was thinking again about this in the Harvard Art Museum today because so much of the focus there is on modernism and and then there's this shift into the post-war period in their collections. And because they have a focus on German art in part of it, there's a lot of 
of German art from the immediate post-war period. So I was thinking a lot about wrestling with that, that rupture in the middle of the 20th century, which was not just a rupture if you're Jewish, it was the whole planet. World War II is a massive, vast subject. And as soon as you start researching any of it from any perspective, it, it opens up into such a vast area that you, you either leave it behind forever or you focus only on that for the rest of your life. It feels very extreme to me to work with this material. Um, so I really resisted doing a book that had any kind of content about the Holocaust at all because it is hard to talk about uh, in a way that feels new, although <laughs> I would have actually, you know what, I would have said that. Let me put that in the past tense. I felt that. Now I don't because now I'm seeing the way people talk about it in cliche and the way people talk about it in a fresh way. And, and you, can, you can get to the second. This film was made in 1975 and I was kind of on my knees with my eyes bugged out of my head from the very beginning of it. This scene that this is a still from comes late in the film and it is one of the most disturbing and perverse things I have ever seen. I, I think I'll take a little bit of a side here and aside to say, I, I came up and trained in a time when being confrontational in art was highly valued. In the culture in general, in the subcultures that I came up in, in music, in, in visual art, in comics. Uh, and there were a lot of people who were trying to make work that was transgressive. So I ended up kind of coming out on the other side of that thinking, well, you know, I don't think most of us who are trying to do something transgressive are actually transgressing anything. Transgressiveness requires parameters, right? You can't transgress anything if you don't have any bounds around you. Uh, so it seemed sort of like a, a hopeless target to try to hit. However, I have come across several works of art that I do consider transgressive. And this scene is one of them because it transgresses the boundaries of what is usually shown in a film about the Holocaust. You're supposed to talk about there are sort of accepted narratives that you're supposed to use. And I love that this does not do that. So when I saw this film, I thought, well, you know, if I make anything even half this good in my life at this intense, I can die happy. Um, my feeling is that there is no, no limit to how, how grotesque and how, how perverse you can be when showing the depravity of war crimes of, of any particular time period in history. Um, I am disturbed by attempts to tidy narratives about the Holocaust or any similar atrocity and tell a clean story about it because there's no way to do that without lying. I know that sounds really extreme, but and I understand that information needs to be categorized in order to be clear, but part of my goal is to keep the story of the Shoah as messy as possible because it was extremely chaotic and messy and humans are chaotic and messy. There are no heroes in, in the, the true story of any of this. So I recommend this movie. Um, it's not only about the Holocaust, it's also about probably the dumbest criminal in Italy. And <laughs> parts of it are very funny. Um, <laughs> Uh, let's see. I can't remember if there's anything else in this incredibly beautiful and disturbing slideshow. You know what? Let's just leave you on an image of Penelope Cruz <laughs> from the film Volver, from which I also learned a lot about color. No one uses red like Almodovar, and it's not always blood. All right. So how are we doing on time now? Okay, great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work I'm doing now. And then I think q and I'm talking. So now I'm working on a book called Victory Parade. And I will share my screen momentarily. Oh, okay. This is sharing this. Okay, great. All right. So now I'm working on this book that is set during the Second World War, partially in Brooklyn and partially at the liberation of Buchenwald. But there's a little bit of a flashback to Berlin in the 1930s, and that's what this page is from. <coughs> um, this book is partially about women working in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And there's a subplot about women's wrestling that has become sort of, not the A plot, I would say, but 
as important, if not more important to me than the Navy Yard, possibly because I like drawing wrestlers more than I like drawing shipyards. I'm really a figurative artist. And so every, every single time I pitch and, and, and land a book about New York City, then I curse myself because I realize, oh no, that means I have to draw architecture and cars. <laughs> Very few people like drawing cars. So here, um, I'll zoom in a little bit. <laughs> I just copied an Otto Dix painting from a postcard in that bottom panel. That is a copy of a painting called The Scat Players. Uh, but I did sneak in something extra that's not in the original, which is the woman pouring the alcohol. She's a, a callback to the, the war widow slash sex workers that Otto Dix painted frequently. I gotta say, it's really fun copying your favorite painter. I recommend trying it because you get inside of the work it's like if you're a musician and you're covering a song, it's, you, you get inside and you, you get to take it apart with a little screwdriver and, and then put it back together and see how they did it. I did this, so literally I had the postcard of the painting taped to my desk and I did this with a double zero round and a one and a zero also, it wasn't all double zero. I like to work with really tiny brushes now. Um, another huge influence on me is the 1930s and 40s choreographer Busby Berkeley. Um, have, have any of you seen a Busby Berkeley film ever? A couple, yeah, okay. So he was, a, he was an iconic choreographer in film during the depression and the second world war. And when you watch his films, you understand what the term feel good movie means. I mean, they're like these gigantic spectacles that make you completely forget about your troubles, whatever they are. Um, I really recommend one called Gold Diggers of 1933 because it's one of the few dance movies with a plot that you can actually follow that is enjoyable. Usually the, you know, the plots are forgettable. They're just a way to get you to the next dance number. Uh, the Gang's All Here is also an amazing one. That's in Technicolor. The earlier ones are in black and white. He, I don't know if he pioneered this, but he was known for using huge numbers of dancers on gigantic stages and shooting them from all angles. So often from above, creating these uh, really interesting geometric formations that moved in and out of each other. He did a lot of work in the water with Esther Williams. Um, so it makes sense that he shows up in this particular book because this is a book about mass trauma and masses of bodies experiencing trauma. There are, there are frequent images of mass graves in this book, but also the 20th century was a time visually where there are so many images of columns of people, uh, columns of refugees, columns of soldiers, piles of, of dead bodies, huge numbers of dancers on a massive stage. The number of people is monumental in a single image. So one of my writing techniques is that I, I keep a pile of note cards and I just write single beats or ideas on them. I, I learned this from my partner, Tom Hart, who this is, I'm sure a lot of writers do this though. It's a really great thing to do because then you won't forget anything. And that is how I stumbled on a note I had written myself a couple of years prior that just said, Busby Berkeley death scene. I think I wrote that note to myself in 2017 and I found it in 2019. And I thought, thank you, 2017, Leela. <laughs> Because here it is. So I, I deliberately, I'm not showing you what happens right before this scene, but I will tell you, this is an SS officer who's been hanged in, in the camp yard after the allies have, have entered the camp. Uh, this was a thing that happened occasionally where they would let the prisoners have at it with the guards. Um, and when he gets to the other side, all of his, his former... Uh, people he's killed mass in a big dance number and take him apart and sing a little song. And there's also, also a little Oscar Schlemmer tribute in here, who is a Bauhaus artist I'm extremely fond of. Um, I recommend him a lot. These are the random pages from here that I wanted to show you. Uh, in this book, I'm very obsessed with the dream state and the death state. And I was thinking a lot about what what happens to people's subconscious at a time of mass trauma and what happens in places where uh, a mass trauma is underway or has just occurred. I thought of all of this. I pitched this book in 2016. I, I, in, I sold it in June, 2016. Then Trump became president and 
while, you know, so I'm working on a book about a fascist time period while all of this is happening in my own country and there's starting to be highly visible signs of neo-Nazi activity in the street and all sorts of really nasty stuff happening. And I, I, I remember having the thought that this is the only thing I can think of as activism right now. This is the only thing I can do. Um, <laughs> slow, very slow moving activism. I'm not sure it's activism actually. And then while I'm in the final stretch of doing this, the pandemic started. So I, here, here we are experiencing multiple rolling mass traumas, global pandemic, climate change, uh, that feels, it feels like no one in power wants to address most of the mass traumas that we are experiencing now as a species. So here I am working on this, thinking this couldn't be more appropriate for the time. Basically what I'm doing here is shouldering my little corner of humanity's coffin. Um, but on that note, let's look at some wrestlers. <laughs> um, I have a dance and martial arts background and I really like drawing people in motion. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really fun for me. I assume this is still sharing. Yeah, um, but I, I didn't really think about wrestling very much until I, I did a record cover for a band called The Mountain Goats that was wrestling themed. And that had me drawing wrestlers all the time and I, I didn't want to stop. I really like drawing sweaty bodies in space. Uh, so this is an early excerpt of this book that ran in The Believer. And boy, I had fun drawing this and drawing these crowd scenes. Um, I think you can kind of tell from the way that I draw wrestling though, that I'm, I don't have a wrestling background. I have a martial arts background. <laughs> I was trying. <laughs> um, so what's happening here is uh, this, this poor Jewish refugee wrestler is being mistaken as a German and having a little visitation from her dead mother. As I said, I'm extremely obsessed with the dream state and depicting it. That is a moving target. Hard to write a good dream sequence. And I'm not sure this is really a dream either. It's not really a dream. The final excerpt of this that I will show is, this also ran in The Believer. Um, this is the, the Navy Yard character reading a passage from the play Philoctetes to her lover. I wanna talk a little bit about why Philoctetes because I wanna give credit to the person who um, turned me on to that play. It's a guy named Brian Dorries who founded an organization called Theater of War, which I cannot recommend enough. Uh, Theater of War performs uh, classical Greek dramas for traumatized populations, often with the people from those, those communities. So I think they started out doing it with military veterans. Philoctetes is, is I think the play they started with. Um, it's a play about a wounded soldier. And in this particular scene, her lover is a World War I veteran who lost his leg and she's reading this, this scene from, from this play in which this, this soldier has a leg injury, a catastrophic leg injury and sneaking back to her apartment. All right, so I promised to talk a little bit about um, materiality and scanning. <laughs> um, in this dream sequence, which is very definitely a dream sequence, I used uh, in these trees, I, I had the, painted these in black ink with a lot of water wash, and then I dripped from kind of a, mm, 12 inches above it, uh, iridescent liquid acrylic ink into the wet black ink. And what happened was really interesting and hard to see unless you, oops, unless you zoom in. Um, darn it, how do I move this down? It's all right, I, you know, I think, yeah, if we can scroll up in the image without accidentally scrolling up in the slideshow. So you're trying to get in that spot? Yeah, just bring this down. If you could bring the whole thing down. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, you can kind of see what happened. The, the liquid acrylic ink and the wet 
black sumi ink kind of interacted with each other and created a crackle texture that the light from the scanner bounced off of in a way that I really love. So there's things you can't see in the print or in the scan, but, but then there are things that happen that are not predictable that you can. Um, continuing into her dream and smoke break at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And then we move into his dream. About a victory garden full of severed limbs. And some light reading for insomnia <laughs> to end the, the visual part of the presentation. Uh, so this is what I'm working on now and I'm almost finished with it. Although I feel like I've been saying that for a long time. <laughs> I swear, I really am almost finished with this book. Uh, so now would be a great time to open it up to discussion. Right. Um, first of all, um, self-connected questions uh, in the room, maybe first, and then uh, Andrew will come back with questions. Uh, so we'll I, I'd love for you to talk a bit more about materiality and you, I mean, do you see it as a gaining or a loss when, when prints are digitized? And if so, what is gained, what is lost? And, and how do you negotiate that relationship when you're making? That's a great question. Um, I have to not think about it too hard when I'm making it, or at least not think about it as a loss. So what I think about it instead is um, for people who can see the original, they get uh, to have a, a kind of an experience that, that people who can't, um, won't have, unfortunately. And I, I, I wish I could share that with everybody. But when you go into making comics, you, you're making an agreement with yourself that all the work you're doing is mostly going to be disseminated on a mass scale or, you know, mass scale, meaning, you know, a print run of 300 or 3,000 or 30,000, not really huge, but that most people will see a reproduction of your work. Uh, so actually most of the time, for most of my career, I was thinking of uh, uh, working towards reproduction and what, so, so what feels like a, a gain really to me, a gift is uh, working without worrying about that now. So instead of just working in ink and thinking about it as like, okay, this is black and white, it's very easy to, to reduce down and print. Now I'm not thinking about it at all. And maybe this will be a nightmare for the production department of my publisher. I, I hope not. I don't wanna give them nightmares, but, but when I'm thinking about that materiality, when I'm working with it, it's, it's so rich and it's creating so much of the narrative. Um, I wanna say the pigments themselves in their textures, in their colors, when they're wet, when they're dry, are part of the story. The, the controlled chaos of working with watercolor is part of the story itself. So, because, that is, that's, because that's the point at which the portal opens where I have access to the other side, whatever that is, and, and uh, I'm a bit of a closet mystic. So <laughs> you'll have to, you have to just bear with me there. Uh, that's, that's where all the good stuff is. I, I don't worry about what might be sacrificed uh, in the digital or, or print production, but I have been pleasantly surprised because sometimes things come out in really interesting ways. Like um, when the Believer printed these pieces, they looked gorgeous on paper. I think part of that is their production standards are really high, uh, but it just, it surprised me how good it looked even flattened down to a print. Yeah. Um, you were talking earlier about the, the movie from 1975 that depicts kind of human chaos and moral, um, uh, I don't know how to put it, just sort of the messiness, I guess, of everything that World War II represents. And so you talked about how you strive to kind of capture that messiness in your own work. And I'm wondering how you negotiate um, capturing messiness and 
chaos, but also having structure mm -hmm. and um, control mm -hmm. kind of in your narrative. I love that. Um, I mean, the first answer I want to give is, I, I, I hope I have structure in my narrative. I, I'm a little concerned about that in this book, actually. Um, writing a plot is the hardest thing, I think, for me. I don't know. Maybe there are people who are really, really good at it, and that's their favorite thing. But I think a, for, a, I want to say a lot of writers I know, that's, that's the hard part, is um, marshalling ideas into a structure, even if it's not necessarily a story about something vast and chaotic. Um, although really, I think any human subject is vast and chaotic, like even the most interior personal novel, you know. Um, it helps to absorb really good film storytelling, I have found, to, to learn kind of structural um, tricks and not tricks, that's the wrong word, but learn how to, how to structure certain kinds of stories. Um, I, I love prose novels, absolutely love them. But I, I like to say that when I read them, I'm kind of like an ant crawling on a beautiful sculpture. I don't really know what I'm, what I'm seeing. So for me, film storytelling uh, is really close to comic storytelling. It's not exact, but really good film and very good episodic uh, writing for television, like something like Deadwood, you know, or The Wire, like Mad Men, like the really, really high end. Uh, another really good one that's been a big, um, Influence on me is Russian Doll, Natasha Leone's Netflix series, amazing. Um, there's some very serious writing and very, very interesting interplay of interior, exterior, um, real, surreal in, in a lot of that storytelling and very human. Um, so what I look for before any kind of structure and is I, I look for human experience and I let that guide me into the structure. Um, I don't know if this is relevant to your question at all, but one of the things that I'm trying to do and, and something that I'm attracted to in, in a lot of other people's work too is to take time periods that have been turned into a kind of mythology, uh, which again can be very easily tidied up and presented in a packaged nice way. Uh, and open them up and find the really messy human stories inside of them. Now, if you think about any, any film about or novel about a historical time period, right? Um, I'm, I'm, huh, I'm, I'm veering into a dangerous direction here of subjectivity where I'm gonna tell you the movies I don't like to <laughs> do this. Um, but heck, I'll, I'll go out on that limb. I'll say like Schindler's List is a really good example of way too tidy. I called that one Auschwitz for Goyim. Um, it's so clean and so packaged and so neat and everyone is so happy at the end. And, uh, even, even the ways that, are, that it depicts um, trauma and bad things happening, it's very sanctioned, right? So where's the mess? Where's the humanity? Um, to bring it back to your question, when, when I hook into those really human stories and those really messy uh, human dramas, that's where the structure begins to suggest itself because that's the trajectory of a character. That's what the structure has to be built around. Beyond that, I struggle with structure completely. Part of this also is uh, I tend to write uh, in a fragmentary way. So I write my stories kind of all over the place. I don't write from, from the beginning to the end. And I finally realized why. Um, I don't know if I'm making an excuse or if this is the real reason, but I trained initially as a painter. And when you train as a painter, you're trained to work all over the canvas all, all at once. So that's kind of how I write. And I have to say, I don't think that serves a linear narrative very well. Uh, luckily, this current book is not so linear, but hopefully the next one will be. Does that approach your question at all? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good, yeah, okay. Helpful. We have a couple that have come in the chat, yep, so sure. I'm just going to read those to you. Um, from Tom Hart, who has a good question. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Does working in paint or other materials help process trauma as opposed to working digitally or in easier mm -hmm. medium? What an awesome question. I love that question. Um, yes, it does. Uh, but I would say that's a really subjective answer. For me, it does. For you, it might not. 
So for another person working digitally might be the exact key that they need to get past whatever their inner resistance is to making an image mm -hmm. and, and take them exactly where they need to go. Uh, that, that might be the tool. Um, I don't wanna be dogmatic about um, physical materials versus digital materials. But I will say that from my own experience, um, the tactility and the physicality of materials brings me to that place where I'm, I'm facing whatever it is I'm working with. I will come back a little bit to my day at the Harvard Art Museum today. Um, there was a, a bit of wall text about primitivism after the war in, I, in Germany. Uh, I'll, actually, I think it was a Carl Apple painting. He was Dutch, but I think he might have been working in Germany. I'm not sure. Um, talking about a movement of artists who used materials in a, as the wall text put it, I'm going to paraphrase, frenzied, frenetic, uh, primitive style. Uh, so this is a painting with a lot of impasto and hard marks, and, and you can tell it was done with a lot of um, speed and intensity. And the wall text goes on to say this is a reaction to the destruction of, and, and of World War II and, and the absolute horror at, at, at the violation of humanity. Now that's, that's my words. I understand this. Uh, and this is kind of what I'm getting at when I talk about the physicality of materials. Sometimes you're working in a way where it's, it's you and your body um, bashing against the materials or using them as an extension of your body, right? Um, an analogy to this would be certain kinds of music too. I remember when I was in my early 20s thinking, I want, I want to hear musicians playing their instruments so hard that it's like they're breaking. Like, I don't understand how you can play a guitar in a certain kind of mood without tearing the strings in half. Um, Now, this gets refined. <laughs> we refine ourselves away from that working, working in comics. And especially in the kind of comics I'm doing, I, I didn't talk about miniaturist painting, but that's also been a really big influence on me and both medieval European and, and Persian miniature. And it's like an extreme obsessive control with tiny little brushes and, and very small areas of paint, very small passages within the painting. Um, but within that, there are these micro realms of chaos and, and portals of, of emotion that open. Uh, so yes, <laughs> to answer your question. <laughs> but again, I want to say for somebody else, the answer may be the opposite of the answer may be that uh, working in Procreate or another digital um, medium might be exactly the thing that takes them to that, that emotional state that they need to tell their story. All right, we got a couple of online. All right, just a second. All right, so Lily M asks, though you don't write superhero comic books, do you have feelings on the inherent Jewishness of them? Did it influence you at all? Do you think that it's trying to be covered up somewhat at the moment as well? Um, that's a great question, but I think I'm not the person to answer it because I have never read a superhero comic. Um, I will say I, I'm aware of the uh, of how many Jews created the superhero comics world, and I'm a huge Jack Kirby fan for other reasons because the guy was an absolute maniac of an inker, <laughs> drawer. Um, I teach his story Street Code in my classes sometimes just because it's an incredible piece of art. Um, and I love Will Eisner dearly, but I haven't actually read Spirit. I've read his more autobiographical stories, uh, his Bronx stories. Um, I would like to put the question back to you, questioner. Um, is it being covered up? How? I'm so curious about that. I wonder if they would be willing to address that in their comments. Yeah, I'll wait to see if they anything else. Um, anybody else? I was just going to quickly interject for anyone who is both historically curious. <laughs> and, uh, it is mind-blowingly weird stuff. Yes. Um, and I do find, for, personally, Footlight Parade is the most kind of 
approachable gateway drug <laughs> that we were playing. Um, in terms of like it actually having a little more story, not just excuses, but like, you're going to have to have a Judy Cagney's in it, who is mesmerizing. Yes, she's right? amazing. Now. It's pre code, which we all know about from our class, right? So it's like extra dirty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it has by a waterfall. And by a waterfall. Which is, which is a completely bonkers art deco bonkers. water dance so insanity. It's this bonkers, like, are we underwater? Are we under a waterfall? Are, are we, we on drugs? Are we, we're definitely on drugs. It's all over the place. Um, but also, um, you know, just in general, I thought Buzz Murphy is such an interesting reference point. I was thinking, of course, of Susan Sontag's essay, fascinating fascism. Like, but the, the thinking about these moving bodies as a fascist aesthetic that might, if you hadn't seen the film, seem like that's a strange leap. And it's a very interesting leap and move moment, movement. But when you see it, you're like, oh yeah, they're marching. There, there are goose stepping scenes in Busby Berkeley films. There is this kind of management of mass management of bodies that at certain moments will make you think of Lenny Riefenstahl's management of bodies. I wanna, so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's it. I want to say something about that. So I, I just want to say the fascists did not invent that kind of imagery. There, I think I, I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm gonna talk out of out of school about history because I, I I don't know actually who invented it. But I, I think the early 20th century is full of of propagandistic imagery like that, right? Um, although some of the futurists were fascists. Uh, right. But there's a really interesting, the closing number of Busby Berkeley's Gold Diggers of 1933 is a complete mood change. So this, this particular film is goofy. It's kind of a, hey kids, let's put on a show uh, plot. It's set, made and set during the depression. And it's basically people trying to get a buck to eat by putting on a show. And there's all, it's also pre-code and there's also a really fabulously dirty, filthy number uh, that ends with a guy opening up a woman's metal outfit with a can opener. It's wild. The Honeymoon Hotel. Uh, the Honeymoon Hotel, I think, is that, I can't remember which one that's that in. That is the can opener to get into this woman's. Oh, is that in Honeymoon Hotel also? Yeah. Uh, the, the number I'm thinking of is, um, is Petten in the Park. Petten in the uh, Park, yeah. But then there's this total mood shift at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a song called uh, Remember My Forgotten Man. And it ends in this art deco kind of agit prop imagery. But there's also, there's imagery of, this, there's all of these men marching off to war in these clean uniforms and coming back ragged and bloody and carrying their comrades on stretchers, their heads are bandaged. There's a whole bunch of dancers on a, on a bread line passing one cigarette down the line. And then there's like these recreations of Dorothea Lange Dust Bowl photos in this dance number. Mm -hmm. It's wild to see it. Uh, I think it's a really interesting point, though, to bring up the fascist use of mass bodies. Um, I think there's a very short distance between anti-fascist art and fascist art. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that the, the commonality is, um, well, I don't want to, I don't want to say that commonality is only propaganda because so, so much of the modernist art that the, the fascists hated uh, was was not propagandistic at all. It had nothing to do with politics in so many cases, but it was telling the truth about human bodies in war and starvation, which was not um, agreeable to fascists at all. They only wanted um, very able, very strong, very well-fed bodies. Um, it's worth looking at the degenerate art exhibition and then at the counter exhibition that the Nazis mounted of incredibly boring state-approved fascist art. That's a subject I'm really interested in, in talking and learning more about. Um, thank you. Do we, do we have more uh, online? Yeah, we have a question yeah. from Maurizio. Oh, excellent. So from Maurizio Cordero, what are your thoughts on transgression and the passage of time? Does the passage of time impact the narrative potency of transgressive times? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I'm trying to think of comics that I think of as transgressive. I mean, I guess since I was talking about Phoebe, um, I want to say I'm not sure it does impact. It's it's. I don't think it blunts the impact of those comics. You know, it'd be really interesting. It would be really interesting if there was a younger cartoonist here to counter me, 
and argue with me about this or just talk about what younger cartoonists are doing now. Because I have my own observations about certain trends that I see in comics, but kind of the curse of the mid-career artist is that you don't really have time to read a lot of other people's work because you're too busy doing your own. Um, also being a mid-career artist means doing a lot of paperwork, it turns out. Um, so I feel I haven't read enough of, of what's out there now in the last decade or so, but I feel like there's a lot less grotesquery in comics than there used to be. Um, I, this is totally subjective and I could be completely wrong, but I wonder if um, younger cartoonists coming up today might look at something like uh, Nightmare on Polk Street, that Phoebe Gleckner story, or Renee French's work from the 90s, or even Julie Desai's comics, and think like, ew, this is gross, or I don't want to see that, or that that's really like, you know, I, I suspect maybe not, actually, but uh, Mauricio, I wish you were here to actually talk about this in person and, and, and give your own thoughts on that, because I think that's a really interesting question. I think, I think what has changed over time is the way that certain kinds of um, edgelordy, transgressive behavior uh, has been, uh, like w whether it's approved of in the culture or not. I, I, so I'll go outside of comics for a second here. Um, I follow Steve Albini on Twitter and he posted this great thread. Uh, Steve Albini, for those who don't know, is a musician and record producer, kind of iconic recording engineer, but he also is an iconic musician. And in the eighties, he was in a band called Big Black who were very deliberately transgressive, but also he was sort of a professional jerk in that band. I, I love them and I love his writing. When you read his writing from that time period, you can see him like really trying to push people's buttons in this way that was really permissible in the culture at the time, especially from white guys. And so the, the, the newer way of looking at this stuff now to say, you know, we don't, we don't really want to give everybody a pass anymore. That's really good. But he, he posted this thing on Twitter about that exactly kind of, saying, look, you can't, you can't bust me on my past. I know, I know a lot of what I said and did was wrong. I'm paraphrasing really poorly. You should find the thread yourself. He said it much better than I could. And he was like, you know, good luck trying to, trying to shame me. I've already publicly outed myself as in, in all of these ways, you know? And then he sort of talked a little bit more about how things have changed and how that's better. And it was really interesting. As for comics, I want blood. I want to see blood on the walls. Metaphorically speaking, I want I want people to make work that is hard to look at. I think that's kind of what comics are for. That's my little teeny soapbox that I'm ranting on. Um, but I'm also fine if people don't. I'm not sure how to answer the time part of this question though. So do you associate mess with, with this, this paradigm? Are you saying like you want more mess and therefore being messy is to have more because mm. you know, chaos and mess don't always have to be aligned. There's a lot of chaos in minimalism. There's a lot of chaos in yeah. the negative in removal and not just presences of chaos and absence as well. So like how, do you, how are you defining mess and, and this erratic mess as opposed to a clean mess? Ah. Uh. So erratic is actually not a value of mine personally. Interesting. Um, I'm actually extremely controlled <laughs> in my work. Um, but the original, your, your, the first thing you said in your question, um, no, I don't think I'm defining it as only mess. And actually, you know, when I, I'm really careful about what I say in public about what I want comics to be, because mm -hmm. for one thing, who the hell am I? I'm just one person. What I think really doesn't matter outside of the scope of my own work. Um, I want people to make comics and tell their story in whatever way works for them. Um, so I guess I'm just expressing a taste that I want to see intensity. And I think that might be a better word. Um, when I talk about mess, sometimes I'm talking about materials or the physical method of drawing, but sometimes I'm talking about the storytelling or I mean the, uh, <laughs> not the structure. I don't want the structure to be messy. <laughs> the, um, the, the humanity. I think what I'm really arguing for more than mess is truth, though. And, and the truth about people is that we're messy. Although, as I'm, you know, as I'm saying all this, I'm realizing, like, there's only so far out on that, on this limb, this particular limb I can go, right? I also love really clean, controlled art. And I love, 
I love minimalism and maximalism both. Yeah. Is this addressing your question at all? It's not a question. It's just more, I'm just <laughs> curious because I'm negotiating it all the time. Right. And, and so I'm curious about you. Um, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, I, what I'm curious about is what, um, how are you negotiating these, these factors? Um, oh, God, guys, I wasn't prepared. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, in my own, maybe, I guess, daily life, there's no artistic element to it. Just, you know, mess as it, it's represented as opposed to mess as it's felt or, or it is. Like mess as an ontology versus mess as a as a representation, right? Hmm. Can sometimes be in the form of a single line, right? Or like yeah. it can be in and, and especially in kind of sociopolitical environments where where intensity isn't necessarily allowed. Then how does cleanliness become a form of like radicalization or like like an act of radical politics or radical revolution? You know, so that's. Hmm. And that's my own sociocultural background that I come from. Bring, so I'm, I'm bringing a little bit of like nuance to that, the idea of mess that I've seen sometimes in kind of Western artistic practices, contemporary. I love this. I'm so curious about this. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a novice at that. And that's a really interesting um, bunch of stuff that you just brought up. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I would say I also... When I talk about messiness, I think I'm also coming from a teaching perspective where I, for a long time I taught non-majors in an illustration class and in a comics class. And most of the time I was trying to get them comfortable with uh, making mistakes and getting dirty and just kind of basic like dealing with materials that you can't predict and can't always control and just letting, relinquishing some control, letting things be um, like, you know, draw even though you don't know how to draw get charcoal on your fingers, it's okay. Kind of basic stuff that I think a lot of us get through early on, but if you don't have any art training and you're you know, 22 years old and you're a journalism major or an engineering major and you come into an art class, sometimes uh, you need a little permission right. to just make a mess. So kind of like on a really basic level, right? right? Um, I like elements of, of chaos that are marshaled into very clean parameters in, in music and in art as well. Like very intense guitar feedback with a very, very structured uh, rhythm section, for example. Um, I'm really intrigued by your question about when does cleanliness become an act of radicalism? That's where I feel like, wow, I, I do not know. <laughs> um, I think I'm very privileged in that I'm, I, I live in a world where I mostly am alone and not having to deal with um, expectations that I'm always very controlled and clean in my presentation, you know? That's so provocative. I just want to interject that, you know, it, it, those in the room or away, you know, who are not um, artists, but are creating in other ways, like as writers, like, like people about to write a thesis, <laughs> people writing in general. Um, uh, you know, I think some of these issues about how the process works can be applied to a, a writer's, uh, a, a non-painting writer as well, as it were, as it were or a non-comics writer. Uh, and, you know, I was thinking about three points in particular. One was this last one about making mistakes and messiness and cleanliness and just like writing, 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 knowing that like 90% of it's going to go <laughs> and that the 10%, you know, <laughs> this is it, right, is the magic or at least the best part of it, right? Copying from your favorite painter as a strategy, uh, in parallel with copying from your favorite writer, right? You're not plagiarizing, but like, how can I use this stuff? I love this and just experimenting and playing with that. And then possibly most importantly from my own perspective, and people might, you know, I've, I've pointed to three things and everyone might have their own thing that they think is most useful. But from my own perspective, the uh, question you asked really early on, what are you putting in your nebula as you work? I thought was just beautiful because, you know, that's where, you know, if you're reading stuff that you're thinking, I don't like the style or the argument or the method or the sources and like if that's all you're reading, like it's not going to get you in the right frame of mind to do your own work, mm -hmm. right? And it's having that work in the net, you know, even if it's not say media history, media theory, right? But you're just reading the right Tony Morrison novel that gets you thinking about language and and forging a work <laughs> that that can help you, you know, just so so just keep thinking about your network. 
Yeah. What are you feeding yourself with? You know, what are you, what, what's in your diet, I guess is another way of putting it. Um, your, some of what you brought up made me think of um, something I put in my notes, a question that I also don't think is answered, which is where do you put your deadliness? And you can apply that to anywhere in your work, in your daily life, in environments where you are expected to be controlled. Um, where, do you, where do you put whatever you define as, as deadliness? Uh, another thing you made me think of is uh, a reaction I had to a lot of the work that I saw today at the art museum. There's an incredible photography exhibition um, at, at the Harvard Art Museum right now called Devour the Land. That's, I, I really recommend it, but I recommend going with a strong stomach. Um, it's all photographs of the, the impact of war and war industries on America, on environments, on the land, on humans, on communities. Um, so there's a lot of historical photographs uh, from the, the post-war period, but also a lot of um, stuff about environmental racism that's more recent, a lot of it. Uh, well, some of it not so recent. And it made me think about a thing I've been wrestling with a lot lately too, which is just the, the impossibility of comprehending most, most of what happens in this world. Uh, this, okay, so this may be getting close to what I call my two watt light bulb, which is um, when I realize something that's been obvious to most people <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> there it is, little two watt light bulb. But I think it's always worth remembering. Um, I think we, we feel huge to ourselves and we feel like we're supposed to understand things. We're supposed to be able to comprehend things and process information and synthesize it and spit out some kind of product or process in response to it, right? Uh, as an artist, I increasingly feel completely incapable of that. And that all I can do is document certain kinds of trauma that are sometimes really personal. And sometimes they're personal ways of talking about something that's more collective. Um, and I also increasingly feel that I'm, I'm incapable of understanding other, uh, other kinds of group trauma. I try to understand it on a, on a, on a humanity-wide scale, but I, I have to question whether that's the right thing to do, you know, because am I, am I universalizing my own community's experience and, and therefore missing other, other communities' experiences? Uh, does that make sense? You mentioned my mid career first. <laughs> and I'm, I'm wondering what's the, the nature or the source of artistic growth at that point? Oh boy. <laughs> you think that, um, you know, people early on, they still have all of their influences that the other artists or writers that they love that had some kind of meaning for them early on that they kind of absorbed into their own aesthetic. Um, but you're talking about in your career, you no longer uh, as often engaging with other artists. Quite the opposite. Mid-career is when all the good stuff starts to happen. Because up to then, you know, well, again, I don't want to universalize my own experience, but I think, I don't think there's anything particularly special or unique about me, so I'll say, probably common experience for a lot of people. In, in your 20s, you're kind of a wreck um, and just trying to figure stuff out and getting through school, trying to figure out your career path. Uh, in your 30s, you're, maybe you're hustling a lot. Maybe you're starting a family, maybe not. Maybe you're, you're just starting significant partnerships. Um, in my case, I was working as an illustrator and I was completely, I had parts of myself as an artist completely locked away inaccessible, thinking I would never um, be the artist I thought I was going to be when I was younger, because I had chosen this path of kind of lesser resistance. Uh, I mean, yes, I was making comics, but I felt like I was just never touching that source of power. Where, where is, I don't know how to get to that thing I really want to do, and that the, the, the kind of power that I want to have in my storytelling and in my visual art. Uh, and the kind of illustration work I was doing, I knew I wasn't a great illustrator. And I knew that, you know, it was just kind of workmanlike. And it, it didn't really feel like me. Um, it started to kind of break open a little the first time I heard a Nico Case album. 
And mm -hmm. when I heard her music, I thought this is the kind of, she's in touch with something that I, I, I wanna be too. She's, she's got her finger in some kind of electrical socket that, that's really intense. Um, a few other things also, when I, I, there was a huge retrospective of the South African artist, William Kentridge at, at MoMA, right before I left New York City. And that was also a kind of moment of being broken open. Like this, this is really, this is what I'm, this is what it's supposed to be. Uh, around the same time, there was a Kara Walker retrospective too. And that, that had a similar effect, even more, that was extremely humbling to see her work. Um, so for me, I didn't become the artist that, even start to become the artist I really thought I was gonna be and really could be until I was in my 40s. Uh, so the, the thing that happens, oh God, again, I don't wanna say like, okay, this is what's gonna happen to everybody. But I, again, I think it's a sort of common experience. You get to a point in your life where you have enough accumulated experience and wisdom that you can turn around and share it with people coming up behind you. But then also you have, all of this this bank of experience and training and and hard knocks to draw on in your life then that's when the real power comes if you if you can find a way to access it because that's that's when you have that that right balance of all of the messiness of your life and all of the clean parameters of your discipline to filter it through right and it becomes this very focused laser beam um, I would love to hear somebody else's description of this. This is just mine. But uh, the curse of the mid-career artist is really just that you don't necessarily have time to read other people's books. But that does not mean you don't have time to engage with art. For me, it's meant um, reopening my engagement with the rest of, of art that's being made. And I almost said the art world, but I want to make a distinction when I say that I'm not talking about um, the art world that we often disparage. It's art dealers and the money part of the art world. I mean the world of people making things. I, I really tried to run away from it because art school can be kind of a scarring experience. Um, I tried to run away from it into illustration and comics and coming back to it has been really healing. Uh, and you start to engage in a crowd, well, for me, I started to engage in a really cross-disciplinary way with a lot of other art forms too that I had either locked away from myself uh, or, or that I had never even come close to before. And that's that's when the interesting stuff started to happen. So I'm really, it's not really a curse, you know, that's just, it just means I don't have time to follow the trends in comics. And that's fine. Like I was listening to an interview with one of my favorite musicians, Blixa Bargeld, who is in his early sixties now. And there's almost nobody more interesting or disciplined or in, in touch with very, very wild creative power than him. But in this interview, he said, I'm out of touch. I'm really out of touch with what's happening in music. And that's fine. He was talking about having a, a school-age daughter, and how she's really into Billie Eilish. And he's like, yeah, you know, she, she listens to all this pop music that I, I just, there's no possible way I could follow it. That's kind of a pleasure of getting older, too. It's like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let the kids have that. And I'm, I'm over here doing something else. It's cool. Um, the, the other thing about being a mid-career artist is just that you're um, applying for a lot of grants and a lot of residencies, and it is amazing how much time is spent on administrative work. Do we have any more questions in the room? I have a couple of questions. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that the story changes, like when they're, like the pigments are in water, there's a, like it's part of the story, and then when it dries, Told a part of the story. Um, so I'm wondering if every time the painting change, do you think the story is changing? Hmm. And also, I'm wondering whether, like, like what story are you talking about? Like, from what I understood, it's about the story of the comic. But I'm wondering more, like, whether is the story your relation with your art? like what is changing or evolving in these, you know, like when it's, when you're experimenting with the water and you're like letting the watercolor like merge, right? It's one story and then, but it's your, is it like your connection with your painting, with your coming or? It's both, yeah. It's very much my own connection with it. And it's what's happening in the narrative. It's also allowing a door to open um, for unconscious and subconscious stuff to come out. 
the unplanned, the surprising. And some of that stuff is physical, like, oh, I didn't expect the ink to go that direction and then dry like that. And then some of it is narrative, like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that I was actually, uh, you know, here I have, I have characters saying these particular words and having this particular conversation, but then there's these color things happening that are kind of telling, it's a nonverbal signal under the verbal part of the narrative that can either, uh, it's not so clean and binary as it's either reinforcing the narrative or, or countering it. It's not quite that simple, uh, but it's part of the story, if that makes sense. I want to say also, I had really intense color theory training. I had the, like, the really standard Bauhaus color theory pedagogy. And the way that I like to describe that is, it's like they, they put you under for three months and then they snap their fingers and you wake up and you can mix any color. <laughs> like put anything in front of me and I can mix it. And I don't know how I got there, except that it involved cutting a lot of color aid, which is a really irritating substance. <laughs> uh, but something that I did in the period between the 2020 election and the inauguration <laughs> um, was I, I was so I was in this like physiological panic state that I was starting to worry about. Like I'm worried about the future of my my physical health, like I'm going to have like heart problems or neurological problems from the amount of stress that I'm under right now, the amount of threat that I feel. So at, you know, imminent fascism. So in order to kind of build a little barrier around my intellect at the very least, I, I had a ritual for a while where every night at the end of my work day, I would paint all day and then I would uh, take Itten's book of color theory. Itten was one of the Bauhaus color theory teachers and I would read two pages from it every night. And it was so restorative, even though some of it I couldn't understand. Some of it was, was above me, like I'm just too dense for this. And some of it was like poetry, the poetry of color, talking about color. Um, I feel, as I was reading it, I felt like, okay, this now I kind of, I understand the more uh, theoretical and, and kind of existential aspects of this thing I was trained so hard in that comes out in my work. Um, so when I'm in that state of experimenting, I'm drawing on those uh, that training and those experiences without knowing I'm doing it, and really interesting stuff happens because of that. Does that make sense? We're right up on time. Do we have any other questions online that we need to? There might just be a one from Lily um, asked, "Could you clarify what you mean by deadliness?" Mm. Like, where you said not ice. Where you <laughs> Oh, notice where you put your uh, So I think that there are multiple definitions to that, Lily. Thank you for asking. Uh, that's a good thing to clarify. Um, sometimes that deadliness is in your own responses and reactions to the world, uh, to whatever it is that really pisses you off or hurts you or that fascinates you. Um, where do you put th those reactions? Where do those impulses go, right? Um, for me, it takes the form of, um, I want to exhibit some, sometimes I, I, well, let me go back. I'm very fascinated with the line between beauty and brutality. So I want to explore that line a lot. I want to play on that line, kind of like one foot on each side, see where, where my weight is on, on, on either side of that line. Um, and I want to share that with people. So that's where I put my deadliness. Like I, I, I wanna, sometimes I, I wanna, I want something that's pointy, not to hurt people with, but to give people a sense of solidarity. Like I, I have reacted to this thing too. Does that make sense? So where do you put that in, your, in yourself, in your own work? Where do you, where do you I guess in, uh, like in maybe a, another way to put it would be where do you focus your rage? But, but I don't want to make it sound like everything is about rage. It's not. Uh, but, but that's just one way of expressing it. How do you make something out of, out of difficulty, difficult experiences, personal or collective? How do you work with what is difficult? Thank you so much. I think we will end on that note. Thank you for having me and thank you for your amazing questions and, and discussion points.